Bible stand for? It's on the next slide. Right? <laughs> 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 Let's see if we get anything modified over this. <laughs> so GMOs actually stem from a problem that we're facing today. And the problem is that right now on Earth we have 7 billion people. And as it seems today, 850 million people are already without enough food, which is a problem. And in the next 35 years, we're slated to add 2 to 3 more billion people by the most conservative estimates. So as you can see, that it, that's a problem in itself. So you might say, well, why don't we use, just use more farmland, create more crops? Well, right now, 80% of the usable land is in use, which is kind of a misleading number because the rest of that 20% comes in two forms. It's either A, in the rainforest, or B, it's really depleted land that really isn't viable there right now. So if we want to plant more, we have two options. Either cut down the rainforest or spend a ton of money and a ton of time trying to revitalize this land that by the end really won't produce a whole lot of crops. So the first solution that scientists came up to came up for or came up with for this problem is called GMOs. It stands for genetically modified organisms. And how these are made is so scientists like identify a trait in a plant that they want to alter. Say they want to make a plant that they want it to be seedless. So what they'll do is they'll take a plant gene and actually find the gene, like the specific part of the gene that deals with like creating seeds and they'll insert a gene from another organism, maybe a virus, an animal, another plant. They'll insert it into that genome, and then they'll test it out until they get it right, and like, well, now we have seedless watermelon today. So those are a product of GMOs. And they can do a lot of different things by genetically modifying plants. You can get things like weather-resistant plants, you can get drought-resistant plants, seedless, plants that make different colored fruits, but the two varieties that have been made that stand out the most are called HT and BT variety GMOs. So HT stands for herbicide tolerant, and this what, what this means is a farmer can plant a whole field of HT crops, spray a ton of herbicide on it, and everything except for that crop will die. So really eliminate any competition those crops have, they'll grow up bigger, faster, stronger, and create more fruit. The other kind is called BT variety, and this stands for BT toxin. BT toxin is it's completely harmless to us, but, it, but it's lethal to insects, so it acts as a pesticide. So these BT plants actually grow, grow, and they create a pesticide in themselves, which eliminates the use for farmers to spray pesticide. They also have a couple other different varieties. One of them is uh, delays ripening, and this was the first GMO that appeared in stores. It appeared in 1994 in the form of what's called flavor saver tomato, and they found that it took a week for the, for the tomato to get from the plant to store shelves, so they created a, a modified plant that actually took a week and delayed, it delayed the ripening by a week. So essentially, by the time it got to the store, it was if it, had, it just got picked off the plant. So this all sounds good, right? Like a lot of the stuff that happens with GMOs is good. In the United <coughs> States, we've seen a 1.7% increase in yield. It, uh, MIT did a study. And com when they compared it to non-GMO foods, it did have an increase in yield. And a lot of other countries have seen greater yield impacts, mostly due to the fact that some poor countries don't have all the resources the United States has, and these GMOs like, highly affect their yields. Uh, it's also direct, drastically decreased pesticide use, and it's cut down on wasted food. So here are just some quick figures for some of the yield increases. As you can see, it's, it's had a, a profound effect on a lot of countries. Uh, the most notable one for us would be in Hawaii. There is a virus that was threatening to completely wipe out the papaya industry. And Monsanto went in, they actually created a plant that was resistant to this virus, and not only did it, the papaya industry rebound, it actually increased their yield by 40%, so the reason we have papaya still today is due to GMOs. As I mentioned, uh, there was a drop in pesticide use following the introduction of GMOs. Uh, the, the pesticides are the red line on this graph, and as you can see, they spiked around 1999 to 2000, and this is when GMOs really started getting integrated into uh, American culture. And after that, you can see it just dropped drastically, and it's actually dropped by 123 million tons per year since then. Uh, GMOs also have a really good effect in developing nations, as I said. Uh, one country in particular, in particular, they're really affecting things is Ethiopia. They've been, help, been able to develop really drought-resistant plants that are helping out the helping out the people there. I think last year they saw a 15% increase in all their yields. And also, it gives farmers a resource with the seeds when I'm talking about the BT variety. It's, a lot of farmers don't have the money to have a crop duster go over their field and spray it with pesticides multiple times. With the BT variety, it actually gives a pesticide with the seed, which is really helpful to those farmers. 
So what's the big deal? There's a lot of good things about GMOs. Why would anybody be opposed to this? There's a lot of things we, that with GMOs that haven't necessarily been tested, and some studies have linked them to harmful effects. Uh, the first one was the Seralini paper. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner, there are some grotesque rats there with cancerous tumors. This was the most notable study done. It was like one of the first studies done. I only bring it up because it kind of sparked the whole GMO debate. Since then, like a lot of people have gone through this paper and it's been completely discredited. But I just bring it up because it like really sparked things. He said that these rats that were fed GMO foods like were dying because of cancer and the cancer was solely because of GMO foods. But the next study that actually had a decent impact was called was done by Dr. Pastai. He did a study, fed rats with GMO potatoes, and it was found that they actually caused a physiological change to the rat's stomach. They like thickened I think it was the epithelial layer, they said. So while it's not real significant that they thickened like one layer that did no harm, it's, it's really like essential to the fact that they actually cause a change in a rat's body. If you guys aren't familiar, rats have a very similar physiology to humans. So it's like, it's really significant for us. In a more recent study that they need to like do more work on, it hasn't been verified yet, but it's been shown that GMOs actually may cause breast cancer to proliferate. Not, it doesn't actually cause it, but for anyone that did get breast cancer, it really sped up the growth and uh, just like it, metast it metastasized a lot quicker. So something they need to do a little bit, little bit more work on, but it's definitely a red flag. Uh, there's also just unforeseen consequences <coughs> we gotta think about when we're kind of like messing with nature. Uh, like I said, it caused a physiological change in the size study. So what, el what other things is doing to our body that we may not be aware of yet? And that's why I'm kind of talking about like the links to GMOs we haven't made yet. One that's been proposed, and they're working on some studies right now, is I'm sure a lot of you are aware right now that autism rates in the United States have been skyrocketing lately. And if you look on here, starting in the birth year for 1994, that's when GMOs were first integrated, the, it was about one in 150 children had autism. Well, as you can see, as it goes down the list, it increases drastically. And today, the rate is actually one in 50 children. So it's like really, it's really alarming because we don't know what's causing it. And it's, it's also very alarming that the fact that it could be linked to GMOs because that's the whole food, like 95% of our foods are made from GMOs. If it's in any way, shape or form like linked to this, then we have a really big problem on our hands because we don't know how else to grow food at the moment. So it's something we need to look into and we need to start looking at other ways to grow food. And just some other things to consider. They've been uh, recently finding insects that are actually resistant to the BT toxin I was talking about earlier. So if these insects start growing and becoming resistant to our pesticide, we have nothing to stop them. There's nothing to stop them from just coming in completely wiping out a crop field. And that's very alarming. And also herbicide use has been increasing. Uh, on the graph, I'll, I'll come back to it a little bit later. But the yellow, there was like a yellow line on there and it was like steadily increasing since the introduction of GMOs. And the reason, is, the reason that herbicide use has been increasing since we started using GMOs is because the weeds, just like insects, are starting to become resistant to it. So instead of a farmer having to spray his field maybe once a year, now they have to spray it two or three times a year just to keep up with the weeds because they're becoming so resistant. Also, this is more a problem in developing nations, but they can't, like the companies will engineer their products so that you can't take seeds from them. And in developing nations, that's like a really traditional way to get their seeds for the next plant. So they're, kind of, they're like forcing these poorer farmers to buy their seeds every single year. And that's a, that's a huge problem in developing nations, as you might imagine. So as I mentioned, we gotta start talking about alternative methods because we still have a problem, even if GMOs are bad. Uh, the most simple way to do this would be through crop rotation. And it would just take really coordination by farmers to do this. Uh, this is kind of like a small scale version of it. But the idea is if you can build, if you can build like big areas that are large enough that, crop, that pests can't go from one field over to the next field, then you're not gonna have huge like populations of pest buildup that can go from field to field and completely wipe out crops. And in addition to just like keeping on the pest population, this would also keep the nutrients in balance so we have to use less fertilizer every year, which is good for the environment. Uh, another thing that they're looking into is called GEOs, it's genetically engineered organisms. It's pretty much the same idea as GMOs, except they don't take like foreign, like, you know, I was talking, they take uh, virus DNA or they take animal DNA and put it into plants. What they do is they just take 
the best DNA from plants, put it all together and bring out like, bring out the best traits in the plants, kind of create a super plant almost. So the plants that grow will have, have the best prospects for like, for good yields, they'll grow the tallest, grow the fastest, and be the strongest. And what's really nice about it is that there's no foreign DNA, we're not really messing like with the genome, you know, we're not gambling with mother nature when we do this. And this is probably the best, like the most, it's probably the best option I think we have. It's called vertical farmland. And essentially what it does is like stacked greenhouses. So if you can imagine, <coughs> if you can just like imagine a store, like your regular department store. If you stack like five or six of those on top of each other, you can have multiple layers of multiple layers in each store growing different types of food. Then next to it you can have like a seed sorting facility. They'll they'll take the seeds from some of those plants. Obviously most of them will go in like be sold in markets. Take out the seeds from those plants. They'll plant them in pods. Those pods will be transferred to the greenhouse, and then the new plants will be taken from the greenhouse, sold in the markets, and spread everywhere. And what's nice about these is that they could use they could use GEOs as well. So we'll have like super plants growing in a controlled environment where you don't have to use herbicides or pesticides. Vertical farming is viewed as modern right now. I mean, you can see some of these building. You can see this building down here. It's like viewed as like kind of a modern building, and we have a good look in a city. And they can they can be integrated into cities, which is really nice. Like now, you can't put a farm in the middle of a city. Obviously, these vertical farms you can. So, like for OSU campus, imagine Moral Tower, something similar to that. That could be a vertical farm. And if that would, like we can see where all of our food on campus is coming from. I think that's a really cool idea, and it's just kind of cool because people know exactly where they're getting their stuff from. So, I'm gonna show you. Uh, Actually, I won't show the video now. But there's a few discussion questions, like when we talk, just what are your thoughts on GMOs? Should we keep using them? Should we not? The pros outweigh the cons? And I showed you a couple alternative methods. Do you guys think those alternative methods should be the preferred methods? And should we start integrating them now? So okay. My presentation is. Should we circle up again? Circle up. Yeah. All right, let's do it.